we're going to look at organizing quantitative data. When we organize quantitative data, a lot of times we will decide to group our data. Now one way to do this is to use single value grouping, and we use this when we don't have a wide range of um, numbers in our data. So single value grouping would be everything that's a three would go just in the category by itself. More commonly though, we will use something like limit grouping. And when you have limit grouping, what you're doing is you are putting the data into classes that has um, a range of numbers. So we might have from 10 to 20 be one of our classes. And when we do limit grouping, the lower limit is the smallest that can go into a class. So if my classes are from 0 to 9, and then 10 to 19, and 20 to 29, well, my lower limit for this middle group right here would be 10. It's the smallest number that can go into this class. The upper limit is the largest number that can go into that class, so it would be 19 in this case. Now, when we talk about class width, that's the difference of the lower limit and the lower limit of the next class. So what that means is if I take my lower limit of 10 here and my lower limit of the next class of 20, subtract them, I would have a class width of 10. Another way you can think about class width is how many um, values are there? Well, if I go from 0 to 9, there's actually 10 values that fall into that category. If I go from 10 to 19, there's 10 values that fall in that category. So our class width is the difference of the lower limit and the lower limit of the next class. Now the class mark is the average of the two class limits of a class. So my class mark for my 0 to 9, I would find the mean of those, the average. So I would do 0 plus 9 divided by 2, which would be 4.5. Another one that's very similar to limit grouping is called cut point grouping. And this one is only different from limit grouping by the fact that we would write it as 0 and then under 10. And then you would go 10 to under 20. And then 20 to under 30. The primary difference between cut point grouping and limit grouping is that with cut point, you would use that if you have decimals. Like if you have an option of being a nine and a half, that would have to go cut point grouping because according to our classes up here, our groups are only zero to nine and then 10 to 19. So nine and a half would not have a place to go. So cut point grouping is more useful when we're working with decimals. And again, we have the same types of thing. Our lower cut point is again, the smallest that can go into a class. And the upper cut point is the smallest value that goes into the next higher class. So our upper cut point would be 10. The class widths, same thing happens. We take the difference of these two, and then our class midpoint is the average of the two cut points. Some options for organizing quantitative data. We can use a frequency distribution. We can use relative frequency distributions. Grouped data tables, which a grouped data table is just the combination of these two together. And then we can use a histogram, a dot plot, or a stem and leaf. Since we've already looked at frequency distributions and relative frequency distributions and grouped data tables, when we did qualitative data, we're just going to jump to histograms and dot plots and stem and leafs. Now, a histogram is very similar to a bar graph, but the x-axis is usually a range of values. On this diagram, I left my x-axis off, and what that might look like would be, here's my 0, here's my 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Now, the reason that a histogram has no gaps is because it is on a continuum. So, there was nothing from 0 up to under 10, and then from 10 up to but under 20, and so on and so forth. So there is no space in between here. If you have single value grouping and you use a histogram, the single value would go in the middle of the bar. So maybe this is having 1, 2, 3, or 4, 5. Okay, dot plots. When we have a dot plot, 
we are going to take a number line and we are going to plot our information above the number line. So as I look through here, the first thing I want to do is find my smallest number, which is 199, and then my biggest number looks like it's 258. So I'm going to keep in mind that I need to go from about 200 all the way up to 260. That way I can get a general idea of how I should number my number line. Once I get my number line numbered, now I'm going to go and I'm going to plot each point. So 210 would be a dot right there. 219 is going to be about there. 218 I'm going to put in a different color just so we don't confuse it with the 219. Um, the 225 is going to go there. 223, 250, 258, 238, 199, 218. Okay, now we have a 218 again. Since I already have a dot here at 218, that means I need to put a dot above it. And then 213. And I have another 213, so I'm going to put a dot above that again. Now with a dot plot, um, you, it, let's say I had another 213. I would just keep going above it and above it. So you're going to be building these towers of dots. One thing to keep in mind is you want to keep your dots evenly spaced as you go up and down. And the reason for that is, let's say I added another 218 to my list. Well, if I jumped clear up to here, that would give the visual impression that there was the same number of 213s as 218s, and there really wasn't. There was only three 218s and there was four 213s. So you want to keep them lined up as best you can. Now we can also do stem and leaf diagrams. And with a stem and leaf diagram, we're going to be making a table. And the left side of our table is our stem, and the right side of our table would be our leaves. And what we have to keep in mind is that our leaves can only ever be one digit. So when you come here and you look at your numbers, the very last digit is what has to be your leaves. Well, since I have three digit numbers here, that means my stem has to be a two digit number because my leaf can only be a single digit. When I start looking at my stems, I see I have a 21, a 21, a 21, 22s, 25s. Looks like my lowest one is a 19. So I'm going to start with a 19 and then I'm going to go to 20. 21, 22, 23, 24, and it looks like 25, I believe, is my biggest one. Now, in order to go back and do my leaves, I need to find anything that starts with a 1, 9. And in that case, I only have this one right here. Since the 1, 9 is the stem, its 1's digit is my leaf. So for my leaf, I have to put a 9 over here. Then I'm going to drop down to anything that has a 2, 0 for the stem. And as I look through there, there isn't anything, so I'm not going to put anything on this line. You cannot put a 0 there because otherwise that would indicate that there was something, that it was a 200. So then I'm going to go down to my 21, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of them that, ha that start with 21. When, you, when that happens, you then put them in order from smallest to biggest. So my smallest leaf is a zero, so that one's going to come first. And then it looks like I should have a three and a three. So I need to put two threes in here. Then I have an eight and an eight. So I need to put two eights. And then finally my nine. Now I can go to my 22s. For 22s, I've got one, two of them. And again, I put them in order, so the three would come first, and then the five. And it's important, again, to line your leafs up. That way, you can compare them to each other without having to worry about being off on their distances. 
then go to our 23s, and I only have one of those, and that's an 8. And then 24s, I don't have any of the 24s, so then I have to go to my 25s, and I've got two of them, so I've got a 0 and an 8 here. So now, from our stem and leaf, we can get the visual that there was the most of the 21s because it has the longest line. When you're reading a stem and leaf plot, let's say I want to know what does this number right here really represent. Well, you have to put your stem together with your leaf, so it would be 2, 2, 5. So that 5 right there would actually represent 225. So that's our stem and leaf diagram. Okay, now distribution shapes. When we get a graph, it can take a variety of different shapes, and there are some common ones that we will look at. And if you look in your book for the different shapes of distributions, you'll see that there's a lot of them to choose from. The most common one that we will use is the bell curve. We will actually spend a lot of time working with the bell curve. Some of the other common ones we will be using are right skewed, which is kind of a bell curve, but it's not symmetrical. And then we will also have left skewed ones that we will work with. Um, we've got reverse J, J shape, uniform, triangular, multimodal, bimodal. So all of those we will deal with a little bit, but our most common one is by far going to be the bell shape and then the skewed ones. We're going to look at how does a population in a sample distribution compare. Now remember a distribution is a visual representation. It's usually a, a graph of some sort. And when we have a population distribution and a sample distribution, what will happen is that if you have a simple random sample, the sample distribution will approximate the population distribution. Now keep in mind that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It is just an approximation. It'll give you the general idea most of the time. So let's say I do a sample and I get a graph that looks like that. And this is my sample distribution. What you should realize is that more than likely the population distribution will be similar. Even though it's similar, it could still be be different. Maybe the population distribution comes like this a little bit. Still has a similar size shape, but it is slightly dis different. So the sample will just approximate the population distribution. One thing to keep in mind is that the bigger the sample, the better your approximation will generally be.